Hello everyone, I am very excited to be doing this video. As you might have guessed from the intro, this video is going to be sponsored by Tormach, and for good reason. This right here is the Tormach PCNC 440. 440 just came out, and it's the smallest of their three mils. They've got the 440, the 770, and the 1100, and this is one of the first 440s to actually ship to a customer, and I've got one right here. I've got this big crate, which includes the mill. I've got this three other smaller boxes, which um, I'm guessing probably include pieces of the stand and the enclosure. And then there's a pallet here, which includes all the other goodies, my guess the controller and some of the other things. This is the deluxe package. So the deluxe package kind of includes everything you would need to get started. It has drill bits, it has end mills, measuring tools, everything you need just to plop it down and get started with machining. Um, I wanted to do this video to give you kind of an idea of how much space you need, how big this mill is, and what kind of the unboxing and unpackaging is. When I got my last mill, I didn't really know how it would be with a freight company coming, dropping off a crate, and then having to set it up. So I'm going to show you what it takes to put one of these things together, how big the boxes are, how much room you need, and what other little things you need to get it up on the stand and whatnot. I'm going to start by breaking open this box or this pallet, and we're going to see what's inside of that. I'm going to move on to these, see what's inside of these, and then finally move on to the actual mill itself. So, welcome to the unboxing video for the Tormach PCNC 440. As you can see, there's a whole lot of boxes here. Some things are pretty obvious. We got the clamping kit, the vise, the monitor, other things like these boxes. I'm not quite sure what's inside. It's kind of a mystery. So I'm gonna open these up and just kind of lay everything out and show you what is all included with deluxe kit. There's a TTS operator set, which includes a granite plate, height gauge, a bunch of tool holders, both um, collet set screw, some collets and some drill trucks. There's a vice operator's manual. You've got an um, assortment of end mills and also drill bits. Drill bits are fractional, lettered, and numbered. A little Huat organizer, some whey oil, coolant, and of course the PathPilot controller, which has everything you need including a keyboard, mouse, and jog shuttle. The other thing I wanted to talk about was this little beginner's pack that comes um, in the pallet. It's a box that includes all sorts of little goodies. That's a DB25 cable for connecting the PathPilot controller to the machine. Uh, you get a Tormox sticker and then just some, you know, basic papers, appendums to the manual. This is a um, subscription to Autodesk Fusion 360. The machine comes with a year-long subscription, which is really nice. It also includes a packing list for everything that you would expect to find in this kit, a leather from Tormach, um, a magazine that you can flip through, and also the manual, which is printed out in this binder, so you can easily reference the things that you need to, and you don't have to go looking online, which is pretty nice. I should also mention that included with this kit but not shown are the flood coolant kit and the essential gauge measuring kit. Both of these were out of stock at the factory, so I'll have to wait till sometime in January for them to be shipped, and I'll do some update videos showing that. I started with this first box, and they're just, you know, pretty basic pallets. Just get out a hammer and a crowbar and, you know, pry them open. And it turned out that inside the first box was the chip tray. And so I just kind of tore open the crate and got that out. The next box I opened was the enclosure. There was a lot of little pieces inside there, and once I got the box opened, I just unpacked everything and just kind of, you know, saw what was inside there. But there was a lot of little pieces, and I probably should have saved this till later and just set the box aside, but I wanted to kind of open it up and see what everything that was inside. This box was definitely the heaviest of the three, which is good, because on opening I figured out that this was the stand. The box definitely had a bit of heft to it, and although most of the components for the stand were relatively thin, the main components, which I'll explain later, were actually very heavy and added a lot to the weight of this box. And it was also nice to see that there was an ample amount of packaging and there was very little way that anything could have been damaged inside of this, so I was pretty happy about that. Next, I decided to build the stand. I did this before uncrating the mill because I needed something to set the mill on when I unboxed it. So I started by setting some cardboard down on the ground and just kind of looking at the instructions and figuring out what I needed to do to get the stand built. The stand uses these four pieces of steel as kind of the um, uprights in the corners, 
and it uses relatively thin sheet metal for the back and the sides, and it has doors in the front, and the relatively heavy plate that sits on the top. My first impression of the stand from just kind of unboxing it and um, starting to put it together was I thought it was going to be really flimsy. So you know, I really wasn't that happy with the stand at first, but really after putting it together, it turned out to be very sturdy. There are some issues with it that I'll mention kind of here in the build. You're going to need some 1032 nuts. Every so often, just by hand tightening the 1032 screws that go into the sheet metal, because the sheet metal was relatively thin, it was pretty easy to strip out the threads. So I had a box of 1032 nuts on hand, so I could put that nut behind the screw just to give a little bit of extra security. I also used Loctite on every single one of those screws just so things didn't rattle loose. The other thing that I should mention is some of the holes weren't perfectly tapped for the 1032, so I ended up just having a drill on hand with a 1032 tap that I could just run in and out of the holes real quick, and it made the whole assembly a lot easier. The actual mill rests on a really heavy top plate that sits on top of the stand, but also in addition to that, there's these two metal rails that run front to back, and they help support that top. And then you have these four square metal blocks that sit on top of the stand, and those are attached with um, two M12 screws for each one. So that whole thing is really secured together, and then that just tops off the whole stand. And then the chip tray has little pucks that kind of align directly to those. That sits on top of those four metal blocks, and then the mill sits on top of that. So it was actually pretty sturdy once that top plate went on. The last thing I need to do with the stand is flip it over on its side and then attach the feet. The feet that actually came with this were just half inch 13 bolts and they just kind of screw into the bottom with a nut and that is your adjustment. For anyone buying this stand, I would highly recommend just getting a half 13 inch leveling foot from McMaster Car or Amazon. There's nothing wrong with the bolts. I would just feel better using a proper leveling foot. The stand's all built, finally. And um, I put the chip tray on here, and I notice it's um, actually kind of wobbly. So I'm going to go try and find something heavy to put on top of it to kind of straighten it out. Now it's finally time to get the mill out of the crate. Go along the bottom of the crate and uh, unscrew the screws that are at the bottom. You can crack open the crate too, but it's a lot easier to just unscrew it at the base. And then the whole top of it just lifts off. And after we get that done, we're going to hoist it up on top of the stand. This is by far my least favorite part of the process. I had to borrow an engine hoist from a friend, and we quickly learned that the legs on the engine hoist were too narrow to fit around the front of the pallet. So we had to kind of go around the side, and first we lifted the mill up just enough to slide out the pallet, and we thought that we could get the engine hoist under the stand from the front, but it just didn't work out that way. So we actually had to lift it up in the air, go around the side of the stand, and do it that way. And the other thing is these engine hoists only go so high, so you have to take the chip tray out of the way, lift it up, move it to the side, move the stand out to give enough clearance, and then kind of slide the chip tray underneath of it and lower the mill on top of that whole thing. It was a little precarious and it was kind of difficult, um, but ultimately we got it done. The other thing to note is that when we put the chip tray in place, um, we're using these kind of wood clamps in between the um, pucks on top of the stand and on the bottom of the chip tray just to kind of align everything because the chip tray is just sitting there. So if the mill just kind of nudges it a little bit, it'll move out of the way. And here we have the bolts kind of just resting in the base of the mill and we use those for alignment since they're pointing down, they would kind of find their way into the hole so that when we slowly lower it, everything would kind of lower right into place. And we also zip tied all the um, wires out of the way as well. Now that the mill is up on the stand, the hardest part is done. Before I put on the enclosure, I'm going to show you some of the kind of features and aspects of the mill, because once the enclosure gets on, it's going to be really hard to get these angles and film some of the stuff from the outside. So um, let's kind of walk around the mill and I'll show you a couple of the little features on it. Looking at the left side of the mill, there's some interesting things here. This is a little plate um, that comes with the mill and that sits right there once it's all cleaned up. Gives you a nice little shelf and also protects the motor. Um, the motors are one of the interesting things to me. 
These are all NEMA 34. This is a relatively small mill, but on my homemade mill, I only use the NEMA 34 on the Z axis. The X, the Y, and the Z all have these really beefy NEMA 34s. And in here, there's a really beefy coupler, and we can see the ball screw in there. Everything is covered with these um, nice cable sheaths. And here you can see all the oil lines. They have um, a nice metal braiding on the outside. And then we have a manual oil pump over here. So all this is actually really nice and really not that common for a mill of this size. Looking at the front of the mill, we can see this nice um, way cover here, which um, helps from keeping the chips out. And here is the limit switch for the X. You've got these nice adjustment blocks, and then you have this really nice switch here. This whole thing gets covered by this panel that bolts on like that, so it keeps everything out of it. I'm gonna clean this all off, clean all this packing grease off of it before I attach that, but it's a nice feature that it kind of keeps stuff from getting inside of there. So here is the other side of the mill. This big box right here is the electronics enclosure. It includes all of the electronics for operating the mill. The thing about this is the access panel is actually on the back side. So if you're going to have this right up against the wall, keep that in mind. You need the back side to access all the electronics. Inside this little cover panel here is the spindle motor and um, the drawbar and everything else. The spindle motor goes up to about 10,000 RPM. It's got two speed ranges on these two spindles here. And this little guy is just kind of an interesting little mechanism that clamps in front of the draw bar so that you only need to use one hand. And then when you close the drawer, it moves out of the way. The other thing I want to mention about this mill is this little eye hook in the top. This is how you lift the mill up and down, which you saw earlier. The problem is, is this hole is really small. It's only three quarters of an inch in inner diameter, and the hook on the engine hoist is much, much bigger than that. So the hook would just barely kind of go into there. So I got this clevis, which is about five bucks at a hardware store, and it allowed me to connect the hook from the engine hoist into that. So I just unscrew this, go in like that, and it gives me a much bigger inner diameter for getting the hook inside there. And this was absolutely essential in hoisting it up. So if you're getting one of these, make sure you get one of these before you get the delivery, just so you can hoist it up. Lastly, this is the side of the electronics enclosure. Here we have the main on and off switch. We've got a DB25 for connecting to the PathPilot controller, an accessory port, and then two other little expansion blocks here. I'm not really sure exactly what these are, but probably for future accessories. The first step to building the enclosure was to drill and tap three holes on the left-hand side of the column of the mill. These are used to secure a panel on the side of the mill, and then everything else kind of attaches to that. Everything went pretty smoothly with building the enclosure until I got to the right-hand side. On the bottom of the electronics enclosure, there's a little flange that comes down and that was getting in the way of the right-hand panel. In the instructions, they never really showed this piece on the bottom of the uh, electronics enclosure, so I didn't really know if it was supposed to be there or not, but I kind of liked having it there still, so I just kind of notched out a little piece in the right corner of that panel, and then everything went together fine after that. The whole assembly process for the enclosure does take quite a bit of time because there's just a lot of screws. And you have to hold up a panel, you know, screw it in place, and then tighten it down. So it just took some time, but it really wasn't that difficult. You just kind of have to make sure that everything lines up before you tighten everything else down. And the doors were a little bit finicky to get in place, but overall it really wasn't too bad. A little thing that I like about this enclosure is the little side windows. They have these handles on them. And they roll up like that so that you can reach inside. It makes it really handy to get stuff in and out from the side. I might make a little latch or something like this to keep them up, but it's a cool little feature. So here is the 440 with the enclosure and the stand. I really like this enclosure. I'm very much looking forward to having a machine with an enclosure because every time I use a fly cutter, chips go everywhere. It gets all in the house. So I'm actually very much looking forward to having this. Overall, the enclosure went together pretty much like the stand. It started out pretty good, and there was just a couple little tips and tricks here and there. Just be patient, take your time. 
Another thing I would advise is don't tighten everything all at once because when you work from the left to the right, once you get over to the right hand side and put in some of these filler pieces, you know, things might be slightly out of whack. So just leave everything loose so that you can tighten it all down. I end up having to use a step drill bit just to widen a couple of the holes because I didn't want to go back and loosen everything else up because there's a lot of screws on this thing. Uh, overall, it went together pretty good without any issues other than what was previously mentioned in this video. The one thing I will mention is the doors. The doors have this little flap or flange that kind of fits in the middle so that the doors, you know, can sit flush to each other. And in the instructions, they have it in the back, but I actually like having it in the front. It ends up closing better like that, so your mileage may vary, but I just kind of flip that up. Everything else, pretty good, good instructions, and um, really happy to have the stand and the enclosure. This concludes the unboxing and the initial setup for the Tormach 440. Hopefully that gives you a better idea of what's all involved in getting this thing set up. I filmed this over the course of several days, and the filming actually takes a lot longer than just doing the work alone. I would say that someone could get this done easily in a weekend by themselves, possibly a little bit sooner if you had some help. Overall, it took about three days with the filming to do everything that you saw in the video, but I was also learning everything from scratch. A couple of things to help you out when you're doing it is if you're going to get the stand, go ahead and get some half 13 leveling feet. Have those on hand. Also have on hand maybe some extra 1032 screws and also some 1032 nuts just in case. Um, as far as the enclosure goes, it just takes a little bit of time, but everything goes pretty much as you would expect it to go. For hoisting the mill up on the stand, definitely have an engine hoist. You can try it a couple different ways, but engine hoist is really the easiest way to go. And just make sure you go out and get a clevis because I'm not sure of any hook on the market that's going to be able to fit into that tiny little hole. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about kind of the electronics and the controller side of the Tormach. We're going to get cleaned up, hook up the PathPilot controller, hook up the computer, and start getting things moving. See you then.